Hello and welcome to the building blocks of deep learning where we learn about different deep learning layers and when and why do you use them. Um, today we're going to be going through a real world example um, using a lot of the knowledge that we've built up. So if you've not watched all of the previous videos, I would, I would highly suggest doing so. Um, the tabular data, the variable length features, and the uh, categorical variable uh, video would all be really uh, helpful in doing this one. The ordered um, would not be super helpful, but I mean, it's always good to, um, it's good to refresh and you could actually use that in this example as well, uh, which might actually be a great exercise for you. So we are going to be using the what's cooking data set. Um, and so what this data set looks like is it looks like they've got, there's a cuisine, uh, there's an ID, um, there's a set of ingredients uh, that are associated with it. That's basically it. Um, so you need to try to predict which uh, cuisine it is based on the ingredients. And it's kind of, in some cases, it's kind of easy. So like black olives, uh, you know, grape tomatoes, you know, whatever. It's Greek. That makes sense. Um, but this one, water, vegetable oil, vegetable oil, wheat, and salt. I mean, that could that could be anyways, anything. So anyways, it's a hard task. Um, you're only given the ingredients. You need to go ahead and predict which cuisine it is. So how are we going to do this? Um, so I, let's let's think about it here. I mean, what would you do, right? So first off, what type of data do we have? Um, you might sort of say like, okay, we've got categorical data. Um, we've got um, romaine lettuce, black olives. These are these are categories. There's not numeric data, so we have no numeric data. But in fact, we do actually have some numeric data. Um, one of the key pieces of numeric data that might be interesting is the uh, the length, the number of ingredients. So some specific recipes might have, uh, some specific cuisines might have more ingredients than others. Uh, so that's probably a feature that we should also include. Uh, there's there's actually more features than that. We, we could go ahead and include some other things to it as well. Maybe even sort of the length and number of characters might be interesting because because some uh, cuisines might have uh, longer names. Um, so the average length of number of characters of these guys. I don't know, uh, but at least knowing the, the sort of length, the, the number of ingredients might help us uh, in the cuisine. So we've got one numeric feature and then, and then some categorical features. Uh, these categorical features are high cardinality, which means we should probably use what in neural network speak? Should probably use an embedding. And then finally, how are we going to, how are we gonna look at these features? Um, are they, is there a set length to them? No, it seems like they're variable length. So we probably want to use either ordered variable length features, aka RNNs, or uh, just the variable length features, aka CNNs. Um, in this case, I'm not sure if there's a real order to these, like if there is really a reason why they put water first and vegetable oil second. So I don't think these are ordered. So let's use the variable length features, in which case we can use CNNs. So we kind of have a, a good idea of what we'll do. We'll need to um, extract the length. We need to standardize the length. We need to uh, categorically encode all of our, our features. Uh, we need to go ahead and embed all of our features. Uh, we need to, uh, for each of these sort of categorical features, we'll need to go ahead and apply a convolutional neural network to it. Um, we need to aggregate the uh, the results of that. And we'll need to apply a dense uh, network as well, probably adding in that extra numeric feature. So we've got we've got kind of a good sense of what we'll do, so let's get to it. Now, the rest is basically syntax. Um, so first thing we wanna do, uh, we want I, I use something called a label encoder. I do actually have a video on label encoding, so you can check that out if you'd like. Uh, this will go ahead and it will take each of our classes and it will convert it into a number. That's basically it. Um, uh, next, we want to go ahead and have um, uh, labels for our categories. There's more than two categories in this case. Um, so in this case, we're going to have to uh, have a one-hot vector uh, that has a one where the category is is true and, and a zero on the category that is uh, when it is not true. So it's going to be a lot of zeros and, and basically a one. Again, I do have videos on this, so you can, you can check them out. Um, but this is basically an artifact of, of the way that tf.keras, uh, and so this is tf.keras.utils.2categorical. It's a way of, of how they need to accept these. Um, so because we have multiple classes and we're trying to predict multiple classes, uh, what loss function are we gonna use? So categorical cross entropy. Um, and then what 
um, what activation function would we use? We use something called softmax. Uh, so if you're interested in those types of things, uh, please leave a comment below and we can talk a little bit about them in a subsequent video. So the one numerical feature that I think is pretty cool is the doc links feature. So we can go ahead and use that. Um, so doc links feature is just gonna be the length of the number of ingredients. Uh, because it's a numeric feature, we need to standardize it. So I standardize it here. We get a little bit of warning because it doesn't like to standardize uh, things that are just one feature. Um, so we just, eh, it's not, it's not really, it's not really super important. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it's not even that. It's literally just converting an int to a float64. Not, not a problem. Um, so now that we have our data in a nice uh, sort of format that we want, we need to go ahead and do the padding that we had originally done. Um, so again, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, any recipe that has more than 40 ingredients, let's go ahead and just cap it at that. Uh, we're, we're probably not going to get a lot more information from you know the 41st ingredient uh, if we had it. Um, this is sort of a common tactic, especially in doing sort of natural language processing tasks. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and pad each of these sequences with a... Um, uh, with, with basically a, a, a specific category that's to represent padding. Um, so this is a little bit similar to what we did, what had done before, but a little bit more sophisticated um, because we are, we are very sophisticated. Um, so we'll notice this takes a little bit of time. We have uh, 3,064 ingredients. Uh, these are different ingredients in our data set. The fifth thing is the padding. So we've got one sort of category that represents this is a pad. Again, if we did uh, sampling based on batches, so we sampled all the uh, recipes that had um, uh, two ingredients, three ingredients, these things together, um, we wouldn't need to do padding as much. Uh, one, one thing that people do is they often like take chunks. So they, they pad to five, they pad to 10, they pad to 15, they pad to 20, and then they sample uh, the things that have been padded to 5, the things that have been padded to 10, the things that have been padded to 15. Again, if you're interested in sort of seeing that technique in practice, I'd be happy to do another video. I just I just want those comments, so you, you just got to give me the comments. Otherwise, I'm, I'm just not going to do it. Um, we make a, a, a generator in this case. Uh, we've got two types of inputs, the categorical inputs, which are the padded docs. So these are, these are numbers that have been padded to a length of 40, right? Um, and the numeric inputs. Uh, the numeric inputs is just going to be the doc links. Uh, and then finally, the outputs are going to be these one-hot encoded labels. So, pretty cool. Now it's time to build the neural network. So we've got our data all in a nice state. And notice that it took basically half our half our notebook, if not more, to get the data in a nice state. And this is perfectly normal. It should generally take you 80% to 60 to 80% of your of your code should be uh, just focused on getting the data into a good state. Uh, we have our embedding size rule. Feel free to copy that from me. Um, and now we start our neural network. So uh, we're feeding it a size of 40. So it's 40 by one in categorical inputs. Um, and then our numeric inputs, we just have one numeric input. This is basically just to show you how, uh, how you can add that in. Um, we call an embedding layer. Um, the vocab size is here. And we go ahead and we spit out the embedding size rule from the vocab size here. So we take uh, each of our, our inputs, uh, so in this case, there'd be numbers from uh, 0 to 3064, and we convert them into a little vector. And this vector is a weighted vector, in which case ingredients that are similar to each other, such as like flour and wheat flour, um, will be uh, numerically similar to each other. Okay, so that's what we get. Um, cool. So we go ahead, we do our embedding layer. Uh, what I do here in this case is I go ahead and I take the uh, global average pooling, global max pooling of the categorical variables before I do anything else. Now, why do I do this? Um, generally, you should be thinking, hey, Nate, don't we need to do add dropout and a CNN layer before this? Well, if these were numeric input features, your answer would be absolutely but these aren't numeric input features. In fact, these are categorical features whose weights are determined. Um, so in a way you can kind of think of categorical inputs, this embedding layer kind of being like a layer in itself, like a neural network layer that outputs something akin to the, um, the output of, um, 
the output of a of a linear layer plus a batch normalization layer. Um, and so if that is true, if we kind of have if we kind of assume that the embedding layer here kind of does like what an what a, a CNN would do uh, to numeric layers, then the next thing that we need to do is we need to say like okay, we've represented each ingredient to the best of our knowledge in with numbers. Let's go ahead and combine these ingredients, combine the evidence from these ingredients in some way, global average pooling, global max pooling being a good way to do it, and concatenate. Now this would be uh, totally good in itself right here. So um, so if you wanted to, this, this could literally be the first step of your neural network and you could skip this next step below. But again, we've done this before, so I wanted to show you it working in real life. What we can do is we can take this global information we can concatenate it onto each of the categorical layers, right? Each of these categorical inputs that we had before. And then we can go ahead and do our dropout, convolution, uh, activation, uh, 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 aggregating of this knowledge, and then uh, concatenating these ag aggregations. So again, the way you kind of think of it is embedding layer. So we've represented these ingredients together. Let's go ahead and, and aggregate all of these ingredients into sort of, you know, what's the most important part of these ingredients? What's, what's this recipe kind of look like? Let's look back at each of these ingredients with the context of what this recipe looks like. Uh, let's then uh, take that context um, as well as the ingredient itself, apply a function to it. So that's kind of like the lens at which we look at it. This will sort of give us a new output, which is kind of like, okay, in context of the rest of the recipe, what does this ingredient signify? And then we take the evidence from all of those, all this significance that we sort of built up, uh, and we aggregate it together with a global average and a global max pooling, in which we concatenate. So, so at this point, you should be like, okay, this is kind of cool. Like, I've, I've, I've added an embedding layer, um, and now I've also added the CNN layer together to make something that's a little bit novel. Um, what happened to that numeric input? You remember the doc link feature? Where, where was it? Well, the doc link feature, um, it's for the entire, um, it's not variable length. It's just a single input feature. We can kind of treat it like tabular data, just normal tabular data. And so the only thing I do is I add on the doc length to the information that I got from the rest of the recipe itself. And then I apply the normal sort of tabular neural network that I've sort of made here to it. Um, and it's, it's kind of easy. Um, so I hope this kind of gives you the sense that like, all these tools that, that I've sort of been teaching you before are composable. You could have gone ahead and, and this X, this here could have been a recurrent neural network that was adding up, um, adding up ordered features together. Um, and then you can go ahead and concatenate it. Um, something that I have done in the past, which I couldn't find a good data set to represent this, but there are data sets like this, is that you'll have, um, so again, imagine you're, you're trying to predict default or not default and you've got people with lots of credit cards, and each credit card has a credit card statement, has months of credit card statements. So each credit card has ordered variable length features associated with them, and then each credit card itself is a variable length feature on the data point, which is whether this person will default or not. So what you can do is you can apply a recurrent neural network to the ordered uh, features associated with each credit card, right? And that's the same recurrent neural network. It doesn't matter which credit card it is because it's, it's your processing. You want to process it in the exact same way. After you do that, you've got features that recurrent neural network will output features that are associated with each credit card. So now you've got, instead of a variable length ordered features for each credit card, you apply a neural or you apply a recurrent neural network to it. Now you've got a set length of features for each credit card, um, but you have variable number of credit cards but we know how to deal with that. We, we had dealt with that before with the convolutional neural network. Then you apply a convolutional neural network to each of the, so a CNM, to each of the individual credit cards themselves, and you can aggregate that information as well. And then once you apply that convolutional neural network to each of those credit cards, you'll have a representation kind of of each credit card. You'll have a representation of a person, of a, of a single individual based on all the credit cards and all the order transactions thereof. And then, Maybe you also have some information on the person as well. So maybe you've got their, um, um, I don't know, where they live, right? So their, their state information, and maybe that's kind of interesting as well. So you can concatenate those numeric features. So you have you've kind of have the, the, the features from the credit cards, and you can concatenate those numeric features on top of that and then apply a just a general tabular neural network to it. 
So I really want you to sort of see what's going on here. So I had categorical features here. I don't know how to deal with categorical features just sort of innately, so I apply an embedding layer. Now these, now these categorical features are numeric features. I know how to deal with numeric features, but the problem is they are variable length. How do I deal with variable length numeric features? I know how to deal with those. I go ahead and use global, global average pooling, global max pooling, and then convolutions. So I apply those things to it. And so now I've got just single numeric features. So not variable length numeric features. So what do I do with not variable length numeric features in this case? I go ahead and I apply a neural network to it. So it's literally, it's very composable. I hope you kind of get this sort of picture that, you know, I've got these, you'll get these features in, in a specific way and, and how do I convert them to a state where I can more easily deal with them? That's kind of, the, that's kind of what I'm doing um, in, each, in each of these layers, just kind of like, I've got variable length features, let's, let's go ahead and smush them down to fixed length features using uh, convolutional or neural networks, then I know how to better deal with them. Or in that case where I was talking about, you know, you've got a person that has multiple credit cards, each which has uh, uh, statements that have variable length, First, I collapse the statements down into fixed length. Then I collapse the credit cards down into fixed length. Then I can deal with them with a normal neural network. So hopefully this real world example, this tangent is, is gonna be super useful to you. Um, uh, and uh, I don't know, I, I hope that makes sense. Please go ahead and leave a comment down below. Um, and if you want me to sort of, sort of better explain that, Hopefully that's, that makes sense to you. Otherwise, we'll continue on. So we'll, we'll concatenate these things together. Now we've just got normal tabular inputs. We'll go ahead and add them to the neural network. We'll compile our model and we can look at it. Again, the important thing here, so I'm, I'm not, um, so yeah, look at the number of parameters we've got. It's a lot of parameters, um, which is, this is probably more parameters than I'd like in a neural network. So I probably adjust it a little bit. And probably the thing that I would adjust is the is the embedding size. Uh, I just don't think we have enough data points for it. But but anyways, uh, we'll we'll go with this big old guy now. Um, we'll go ahead and then do fitting down below. It's going to take a little bit of time, so I can talk a little bit over it. Um, so normally I don't I don't necessarily look at the um, yeah boy I don't necessarily look at the uh, outputs or the the connections in this video since I've already looked at them. But it is good if you are just first looking at this to just make sure that these uh, that the network is structured as you would as as is appropriate. Okay, so we've got our neural network as training. Notice the low accuracy, um, and the reason why it's it's lower accuracy than the previous ones is that uh, we are dealing with uh, twenty outputs. So there's twenty different uh, cuisines, um, and so what we're saying is is the cuisine right or is it wrong? And so because there's 20 different cuisines, it's much more confusing than something that's binary. Um, so normally what you'd look at is top five accuracy. It's like, is, is the top five predicted cuisines, are they, are they, um, do they include the actual cuisine that it is? Uh, but in this case, we just look at accuracy since it's easy enough to calculate. And we actually get a decent score. Um, so hopefully this is giving you some intuition on how to deal with real world data. Um, otherwise, uh, we've got lots more to do. So the next things planned are gonna be time series data and natural data. Um, so images, language, sound, stuff like that. If you guys are interested in any other type of data or interested in any of the small things that we've covered uh, here, so like batch uh, sort of sampling based on batch size or maybe the loss functions uh, for different types of, um, of predictions, please go ahead and comment below. But I hope this has been super educational. I hope this has been more nuanced than what you'd get from a typical sort of uh, like practitioner neural network class. Um, and I hope if you like these videos, you'll go ahead and leave a like, uh, subscribe to the channel and note that I try to, I try to improve each time. So even if this is not like the best that you've ever seen, you know, giving your comments and stuff like that will always help. So again, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.